Jessica here is going to talk very quickly about the RSA uh, and then I'm going to walk you around the place and talk about what we're doing. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Jess from the RSA, um, I'm the Areas Engagement Manager at the South East. So I've probably emailed a lot of you. Are most people here fellows? If, I think a lot. Yeah, okay. There's a couple that aren't. And we've got Laura, who's the area coordinator of me in the South East as well. Um, so yeah, anything that you want to know about the RSA here today, please just come and talk to us. Um, there's just so for those who don't know much about it, it's a social change organisation that's got about 30,000 members globally. And um, in the South East of England, we've got over 4,000 of us. And even in Surrey, there's about 400. So there's a good good chunk, there's quite a lot of you even around here. So um, so yeah, I hope today can be a good chance for you to sort of get to know each other and um, hopefully we can start having more events like this in the in Surrey. Um, this, literally this event just stemmed from Patrick having a conversation with me and being able to say, you know, this is something I'm working on, we'd love to share it with the fellows. So it's literally how easily it can happen. So just if you are aware of anything going on locally that you think other fellows would be interested in, if you've got a venue, if you've got an idea for an event, just, yeah, let us know, because we want to keep up the momentum and get more things happening. Um, but yeah, this event itself is literally about platforming fellow-led action um, in, in response to climate change and in response to biodiversity loss and things. So there's, that's like a key area that the RSA works on, like under every Gender Futures programme. It's also a lot of work around education and future of work, kind of all kinds of things. So, um, so yeah, if you're interested in any of those sort of issues around social change, just come and chat to us and we can let you know a little bit more about the RSA. <laughs> Basically, um, uh, checkered history to this place. It was uh, agricultural land about 20 something years ago. A um, person bought it um, without any planning permission, put a building up, fought the council for 10 years, eventually managed to get a, a building put up. Um, and, uh, and then eventually, of course, like all these things, got planning permission. And, uh, and so that barn behind you was an agricultural barn, which is now a house that we live in. Um, but it does come with what's called a section 106 agreement which means that you can only occupy this place as long as you're prepared to farm but as anybody knows um, 20 odd acres or uh, the land we've got here isn't anything nearly sufficient to make an economic case for farming unless you're going to do something fairly intense which people have tried in the past and failed um, or to do what I'm doing which is to try and rewild and um, to, to basically concentrate on insects um, but before I get going on that, um, so we are, um, uh, moved in here on the 28th of June last year, so uh, we haven't really done an awful lot and the purpose of this um, uh, presentation is to sort of start a conversation and, and to evolve it so as time goes by and we do things here, we'll hopefully do repeat presentations and people can come along and see what we've done and how we've done it and whether it's worked or whether it hasn't worked. So. But this is very much uh, an operation that we're doing without any real structure or uh, any guidance. We haven't got any grants from anybody, we haven't borrowed any money, we haven't uh, asked anybody. We're sort of just doing it as we go along. Um, so the first thing that happened was we have these magnificent oaks here and uh, we discovered that we had tremendous fungus in uh, the one at the top there as you, uh, which is on the ground now had to come down because it was literally about to fall on the road uh, we've had to x-ray all these trees this one has got some fungus but it's reasonably safe um, uh, and so we had to spend quite a lot of time just preserving these glorious oaks <laughs> we planted eight or twelve oaks just below here uh, which then got instantly eaten by vermin in the winter but luckily they have survived and they're coming back again so we're hoping to have created some more uh, oak trees down there. This lot of planting here is really recovered plants that we've picked up from all over the place uh, and we've stuck them in the ground through the winter um, hoping that they will survive and they are surviving. Part of the biggest problem we have at the moment is, of course, as you're well aware, in the southeast corner of England, it hasn't really rained for two and a half months, and so therefore the ground has just got drier and drier. And I took the decision that we wouldn't artificially water because what's the point? You've got to somehow live with the climate change that we're having to cope with. So if they don't survive, they don't survive, and if they do, they do. Over here, we have bought some quite a few fruit trees, and one thing or another, we've also migrated. I had a couple of um, 
walnut trees um, that we've tried to and they were doing really well at the beginning of uh, the spring but of course it hasn't rained and I'm afraid it looks like they're not going to survive. And, uh, a lot of these bushes along here some have survived some have died this was all recycled from other parts of the, uh, the farm so we've tried to to recycle as much as we can. What you're looking here is the, our first attempt at a wild flower meadow uh, we planted this up or we seeded it up about um, uh, two months ago but of course it then didn't rain so it's only just beginning to sprout. What we did have here was a collection of stables um, on a concrete platform that was beginning to fall down the hill so we took down the stables, we took up the concrete um, and, uh, and we hope that eventually we'll move that building out of the way and we'll be able to carry on this all the way through to the pond. The society's got to understand that to decarbonise the world, it seems to me, if you think of every farm, every city, etc., with vast amounts of concrete that we don't need and buildings we don't need, um, if we're going to do this reasonably well, it's going to cost an awful lot of money and it's going to take initially an enormous amount of carbon before we get to a point where we aren't burning the carbon. Um, uh, and we will get there, as you'll see with the heat source pump coming up later, but my experience suggests that the world is probably going to have to spend something like 20% of GDP, global GDP, to be able to decarbonize ourselves. Once we get there, then of course we will be burning very little carbon because as we proved in the house, we burn virtually no carbon at all to run the house now. We've insulated it. We've got underfloor heating, but it hardly needs to be used. And most of the heat that is going into the house is coming out of the ground for free. And so therefore, we can get to this point. But one of my reasons for doing what I'm doing is to uh, demonstrate how expensive it is in carbon and in money just to get us off carbon. Um, and if anybody's got any better ideas and criticism of this by all means do do please come and talk to me about it this bit of the uh, project you can see some solar panels over there this is going to be covered in a, 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 a portable roof uh, and we're going to be covering it in solar panels repurposed from other places um, so that we will eventually because part of the benefit of buying this property is it's all south facing and we get sun 300 uh, all the way through the day um, so we will be generating all of our electricity we hope for most of the day uh, off here obviously we're um, uh, driving electric cars and this one's been with us for eight years or so so that's a six or eight six years um, <coughs> so that's uh, quite quite helpful to the planet in there and I, you can all go in individually look at it afterwards that is what's called the pump room and this is where the ground source heat pump comes from the field which the physical cost was about 47,000 uh, and then there's about another 30,000 pounds that we spent in digging all the, the channels putting in the pipe work etc so you know you're talking 70 80,000 pounds um, and for, well luckily for me because I completed it by the 31st of March I get a stonking great grant from the government uh, for the next seven years tax-free which will pay for itself and of course I then save all my energy and I did my costings before the Ukraine war came along so I thought it would take me um, about five or six years maybe seven years to get my money back obviously with what's happened now I'll probably get all my money back in three or four years uh, if you're thinking about a conventional cost of, of running a place like this. I just wonder why you chose a ground source heat pump rather than an air source heat pump? <laughs> simply because I had the land okay, uh, and, and because I have actually done an air source heat pump before admittedly 12 years ago and um, it didn't work that well but the reason it didn't work that well was because I didn't insulate the building enough so it had to work so unbelievably hard that after five years it completely fell to bits. Um, it was to make a fish farm so they stuck a great big hole in the ground, covered it in plastic. Um, so we have this now horrible sterile water. This is a, a, a project in itself that will slowly evolve over time. Um, one of the great things we've discovered, so Penny, who is uh, the farmer and doing all the farm, her cows are moving through here on a 60 day cycle. Anybody who knows about the net project, uh, she's trying to follow that or working with NEP on this. Want to know more about that, ask her. But basically we're running the cows through on a 60-day cycle where they eat a third, 
um, they trample a third and they leave a third of the grass and that helps to regenerate the biology of the and the bacteria in the ground and as Benny pointed out to me we now have dung beetles back in the field <laughs> which is absolutely wonderful so that's part of the whole process. Uh, we had an air, air aerator but of course you've got to spend a lot of carbon making aeration so we're hoping to get the water flow going through and then we're hoping to put oxygenating plants in okay. and do it much more na naturally but no I don't want to be burning carbon to put air into the water. Cycling on the field. So I'm assuming the land to cow ratio is quite Low no, it's very low, very low. And that, that is, that is a, another big issue that we have got to get used to. If we want to have uh, sustainable, good quality food, we've got to pay a hell of a lot more for it, and we've yes. got to eat a hell of a lot less uh, protein than we... We don't need to eat anything like the protein that we're eating, but if we're going to eat uh, protein, it should be good quality, uh, uh, and it should be grown in this sort of environment. So where I'm standing at the moment, is the collection chamber. So each of these channels here, uh, there are four of them, um, there are pipes that go up and down and up and down and up and down. So there's um, uh, a huge hundreds of meters of pipes going all the way through and they come, they get collected here, come to this chamber here and then go up to the uh, ground source heat pump room from there. Um, and basically it's that uh, in circulation uh, that gives the heat to the pump that therefore drives the property. They're only one and a half meters down. You don't need to go any further um, because you don't get any more gain from that at all. Um, obviously we get the advantage of the land facing south so it's getting a lot more solar gain in that sense and we also get, <laughs> when it rains, a reasonable amount of water as we discovered in the winter when it was raining. This is actually quite wet normally which is partly why Penny's got lots of grass there because actually there's a reasonable amount of uh, water flows through here which gives us the advantage of um, uh, uh, the energy transference uh, into the into the ground source heat pump. You'll wonder why you've got these brown patches here it's because we're waiting uh, for the rain to occur for the ground to settle and then all of that stuff over there as a part of it is topsoil which will go back onto the top of the, the field um, which is why it looks a bit barren at the moment simply because we haven't put the topsoil back because we wanted to wait until the, 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 the trench is settled some more. Basically this field is going to be our bee field. We've got five hives running at the moment. We've got some recovery hives in other parts of the farm um, and we've got another hive up there. Hopefully in the end we'll have about 35 hives here. We hope to generate about a ton of honey and we hope to be economically uh, self-sufficient. In other words, we hope to get enough revenue to cover the cost of doing what we're doing. We don't expect to make any money out of it, but we uh, do. My ambition is purely for pollination because without pollination we've, we're all dead. Uh, Bob would like to generate some honey. We're going to sell it wholesale rather than um, uh, apart from get, we will give it to family and friends um, but we won't be uh, uh, we're not going to sell sort of small jars of honey and have a, a store and so on and so forth. Where this uh, chalk is and underneath there when you look at the film when you're having your cup of tea you'll see that underneath this chalk is a whole load of debris because there are a whole load of redundant wooden buildings here so rather than take them down and burn them we just put them laid them out sort of horizontally and um, uh, and then just laid them one on top of another so that basically they're facing south with gaps in them and then we gently put a bit of soil on top and then the idea is that um, all sorts of insects so it's like a great big bug hotel so under here is an enormous bug hotel uh, for anything that wants to go in there and live underneath uh, that, that area it's, uh, it's just a great way of using a whole load of redundant material uh, and allowing insects and, and other things to um, to do whatever they want to do. Um, this building, I hope, uh, may be used for some sort of educational purpose um, because obviously it's redundant uh, for the size of farming that we've got here but um, uh, I'm hoping that uh, if anybody's got any bright ideas and wants to run a, a school enterprise for children to come and learn about uh, rewilding and the countryside and, and bees, I've got a building ready and waiting to, to, to go.
door and we realised we've got a neighbour that actually understands what we're all about and supports what we're all about. So, uh, yes, thank you Patrick for that. My, our farm is a Pasture for Life certified farm. Um, there are only 120 farms in the UK that carry that certification. Um, and the organisation is essentially driven from farmers that wanted to change from what are now known as <coughs> commercial farming practices to the old fashioned ways, pre-war ways. Um, it's farmers that are focused on soil health, on rebuilding soil, not using chemistry, um, low impact on the ground and rebuilding soil. It gives us a quality of product that is finished 100% on grass. We don't use any grain, but what that does is give you a superb quality of meat, a high nutrient density piece of meat that is in turn much healthier for you guys to eat. I have to say I'm a vegan but I'm not a vegan that doesn't believe people should eat meat. There is a place for people to eat meat. They should just eat very good quality and much less meat than we eat at the moment and the meat they should eat should be the sort of meat that Nigel and Penny are creating and not the sort of junk that we're uh, are eating. We each have a unique microbiome and everybody processes food completely uniquely according to themselves and it's all about encouraging people to be far more responsible and pay an awful lot more to eat much better quality food whatever that food is that is good for you and eggs are good for people pork is good for people beef is good for people but so are vegetables and nuts and everything else and it's a question of everybody understanding what's <coughs> right for them i have to say i'm also a michael mosley fan partly because he's a, a very good friend of mine uh, but partly because i think a lot of you know his uh, five and two diet i think has revolutionized the world uh, and i think i often say to him and david attenborough between the two of them they're probably going to do more to revolutionize the world than anybody else that, uh, that that's on this planet uh, i mean if, if you might not know of michael mosley but if you lived in Australia you'd know about him because he's a massive out there and he's pretty massive out in parts of America as well uh, huge huge following uh, and he is really uh, rapidly generating uh, the, the the books he's written on diabetes for instance are absolutely incredible absolutely I fast every day for 14 hours I don't eat uh, for at least 14 sometimes 15 hours a day and I have a maximum of two meals a day yeah, yeah. yeah. And this idea that, I mean, this old myth, you know, eat like a, have breakfast like a king, uh, lunch like a prince, uh, dine like a pauper, absolute rubbish. Absolute <laughs> rubbish. Yeah. Does anybody want to ask any questions at this stage? Does it mean that um, the idea of the real wild, be wild, it means you're not going for, going for non-profit situation? So we're, we're definitely a non-profit organisation. I mean, the general... But, but essentially, um, if Nigel was here, he would be explaining to you that um, uh, they are um, trying to run, so that this links into their farm over there. Um, uh, they are making a small profit because they're selling their meat straight out of the farm. Um, but for instance, they buy all of, uh, if, they, if they have to supply any food to their animals, um, it's all locally based, it's non-GMO food, it's not non-soya food. Um, they're paying about 40% more than standard uh, food for, for animals. Um, they are trying to use as much of their land as they can to, for the chickens and, and, the, and the pigs and so on and so forth. Um, but the price of their, uh, so they're producing far less meat uh, and the price of their meat is significantly more expensive than it would be in, in your local supermarket. Britain has probably got the lowest spend on food of any nation in the world. We spend something like 8% of our incomes on food. Um, I think the average in Europe is 17%, in emerging economies it's something like 30 or 40%. We have got to, as a country, agree to start spending an enormous amount more on, on food in order to support our, our farmers who, to get a real uh, income for uh, producing less food but of much, much better quality. Did you calculate the um, carbon emissions associated with soil disturbance when you're putting in the plates? No. I, I, I probably, I, I mean, I, I, I just knew that it was a good idea, that this is what I wanted to do and why I wanted to do it and, and I, I didn't, I didn't do it, I, you know, I didn't calculate how many tons of 
uh, diesel I was going to burn or, or, or what, what effect. I just knew that what I needed to do is get to a point where I was burning far less carbon going forward. Uh, even if I had a, a big carbon expense to get there in the first place. You're talking about the heat pumps and the insulation. Do you have any thoughts on what the government should be doing when it comes to subsidies? Mm -hmm. Sort of what should the priorities be? How, how could this become commercially viable for, say, the average, you know, farmer? If you, if you didn't require a second income, what would have to happen? Well, you could say farmer or individual. I, yeah. I don't think there is a commercial viability uh, at the moment. Mm. I, I'm afraid we as taxpayers have all got to stump up uh, and accept that part of the cost of saving the planet is that we have all collectively got to put money into the pot so that it can be used as efficiently and effectively as possible, mm. including, as I say, things like insulating the houses, educating people to... You know, another factor in this is food waste. Um, mm. By my calculation, and this is totally unscientific, but from the waste of the, the effort of putting crops into the ground, uh, the stuff that we don't then harvest, through the whole chain system, the globalization of the food system, right the way through to the supermarket and the fact we then chuck half of what we buy away on bog offs and all the other bits and pieces, I reckon we're wasting somewhere in the region of 70% of our food. And if we just got that down to 50% or even 40%, that would have a massive impact upon uh, farming, on carbon, on, 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 on lifestyles, on, on, on what we could then spend our money on and so on and so forth. But it's, it's, we have such a poor education, you know, this, this sell-by date issue, which drives me absolutely bloody insane. Uh, that, you know, perfectly good food gets chucked away all the time because it's gone past its sell-by date. Because they don't want to be sued. Well, no, because they don't want to be sued by this, <laughs> this, this, this yeah, yeah, okay. you know. So, so. <clears throat> congratulations on what you've achieved and we are individually responsible, but I can't help feeling that there must be some organisations out there that have supported you or might support someone else in, who had an idea to do this, who might be able to acquire a piece of land and is thinking about um, rewilding or creating some kind of sustainable development on their on the plots they've got. Uh, absolutely, there are vast numbers of organisations. I just didn't want to, because I didn't need to, I didn't want to take valuable money and resource away from anybody else that could use it just as well as I'm using it. Um, and I didn't want to be uh, uh, tied up in, in, in having to sort of seek permissions or, or be managed by a committee. I just wanted to get on and do it. I, I have to say that I've spent years in the jaw, jaw, jaw business and I just got so fed up with it. I just wanted to go out and, and do something and stick a shovel in the ground and, and, and see what happens. So, um, yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I love paying my taxes. I don't want to be a, a, a burden on society. I don't want to take any money out of the system. I want it there for everybody else. And, and if I can give as much back as I possibly can, that's why what I'm, I'm about. For people with slightly shallower pockets, who would you recommend that we talk to? Now, there's a, there's a challenge, um, I, and I don't really know because I haven't really done any research on it. All I have to say to you is that I have been deeply frustrated by the people that I have talked to, uh, who I have found. Um, I had a bunch of kids, kids, 25 year olds who came out of university set themselves up uh, in an organization um, and I said well look if you want to take on this project you've got to design the project you've got to actually come and do it you've got to stick your height, shovel in the ground you've got to live on it you've got to make it happen uh, and they kept going yeah 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 and actually I could see what was going to happen is they loved writing reports for grants but the actual effort of actually getting out and getting wet and filthy on a, a winter's day uh, was just you know completely beyond them uh, and and so I'm afraid you have this situation where an awful lot of people talking about it but not a lot of people actually being prepared to go and get dirty and get down and do it. Are you planning to put up any swift boxes? Swift boxes well we have swallows here Yes, that's and as you may yeah. know, swifts and swallows don't get on. No. So you either have swifts in house martins or you have swallows in house martins. We have swallows and so therefore no. But yes. where you're having tea, we've got swallows already back in the bar, which obviously they weren't there last year. Uh, and uh, so we're really pleased with that. So we're beginning to, and once I've got my solar shed uh, there, it's going to have masses of environment for birds to nest underneath the solar panels, including swallows. You had to say about education, and yeah. one, one yeah. way you might be yeah. in that regard. Yeah. Um, I've done lots and lots of talks to schools 
across the country, mainly around my um, uh, uh, walking to the South Pole uh, unaided and cycling around the world and climbing up various hills uh, around the world. Right. And, uh, so I'm, I'm well versed in okay. trying to encourage uh, children to... Well, more than anything, I'd like to bring some here. I yes! Mean, if you have... Oh gosh, yes, please, yeah. please. Yeah. please. Um, we have a sort of Make a Difference Day, which yeah. is in the autumn. Yeah. And we're always looking for interesting projects to get the children involved oh, in. Oh, bring them all down yeah. in coach loads. Well, and I'll walk them around and talk to them. And give them something to do. Yes. You know, yes. get them working on something. Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah. We can yeah. help with the, yeah. you know, the education, what it might look like. But if yeah. you're up for, yeah. up for a day in October... <laughs> we can get them lost in the pond. Brilliant. And, and, and you know, uh, re re rewilding and, and, uh, and making the pond a better place. For yeah. Us. My, my chief executive officer says to me, uh, Patrick, I'm not, we're not going down that road. Um, and so I have to go off and do something else. And then sometimes she says, yes, that's a really great idea. Uh, and because I'm so full of energy and motivation, uh, it tends to happen, doesn't it? <laughs> Over there you've got East Grinstead. Uh, you can't actually see it, but I can see a, a, a church tower, do you know what I mean? And then beyond there is a uh, forest, as uh, um, Ashdown Forest. Straight ahead of us is um, uh, Devil's Dyke. Uh, over there, believe it or not, in the middle distance is Croy. You can't see it at all, it's quite extraordinary. Over behind the ash tree there is Chatham's Airport, and you can just see a plane just taking off out of the tree and this one's landing in the tree. It's extraordinary how actually in a relatively highly densely populated area, it's very difficult to see the people in here and there's an awful lot of uh, uh, you know, environmental cover uh, despite all our concerns about the environment.